In this video we are going to talk about arrows. In the last video we have tackled category theory and structures such as functors, applicatives and monads that provided us with the theoretical frameworks for our code. Arrows are another structure representing an abstract sense of computation, specifically focusing on composition. In essence, they are a computation parameterized over the input and output. So essentially, arrows are very similar to simple functions, but lifted into their own context. Why that is helpful, we will see later. Arrows are all about composition. So we need to master the building of new arrows from existing arrows. All the needed classes that we need for this video are accessible after importing control.arrow. Okay, so when looking at the type class for arrows, we see many functions, but luckily the minimal definition only needs two of them. The first one, r, is used in order to lift an ordinary function into the arrow context. The other functions are used for composition. So let's take a closer look. R is our basic building block. It lifts a function into the arrow context, similar to return in the monadic context. Here we can see how to read the type of arrows. The function going from B to C has transformed into the arrow B to C. A very well known and absolutely not made up fact is that this function is known as the pirate function due to its name and I will continue calling it that for the rest of the video. First is our first combinator. It takes an existing arrow and creates a new arrow that works on tuples. The supplied arrow is used in order to change the value of the first element. Working on tuples is useful because we can split the data flow of our computations and represent them as tuples. If we can work on the first element, we of course are able to change the second element with the second function. The combination of first and second yields the triple star, which combines two arrows uh, to act on the first and second element of the tuple independently. It gets interesting once we use the triple ampersand in order to split a single value and create a tuple from it, which then is used with the supplied arrows. Essentially, the incoming value is just copied. Okay, so we have seen a few combinators, but you might ask yourself, where is the simple composition of arrows? Well, in order to find it, we need to pay attention to the definition of the arrow type class. Every arrow is a category. And looking at the type class, we see that these categories line up with our definition for categories in the last video. We are really talking about categories in the category theory sense here. So we have the identity and the composition of morphisms. If the definition of categories isn't really clear, you should check out my last video on category theory. Okay, so now we can define a new operator which will denote our composition. It's simply the category composition with flipped arguments. Since every arrow is a category, this definition also holds for arrows. This operator is where the name arrows comes from. The initial definition of the arrow class only consisted of the pirate function and this arrow operator. This has changed over the years, so we are covering the most recent definitions at the time of making this video. So let's look at an example instance of this class, the instance for the function type. As we can see, the pirate function doesn't have to do any lifting since functions are already composable. The triple star is defined in a trivial fashion and the rest of the class is derived from it. And with that, we have all the building blocks to build computations. A combination of some of these building blocks might look like this. But any wild combination of splits is possible. So it is possible to split the computation multiple times. That raises the question, how do we combine the tuples afterwards? In order to answer this question, let us look at an example. 
Here we have two arrows, A and B, doing some computation and the comb arrow that is not used in order to fix your hair but to combine the values of a tuple into a single value. There is no special function to do this kind of operation even though we can use the uncurry function to have this kind of effect. The resulting arrow C is the combination of A, B and comb and looks like this. Here we have an example, be it artificial, showing how the data flows through our arrow. This is really the essence of arrows. It is directed data flow through a sort of pipe, quite similar to Unix pipes, but with even more functionality. So this data flow is great and all, so let's do some input output with it. A program like this might be useful. We can specify the direction of data going from the input to the output. Sadly, this expression results in a type error instead of a useful program. The problem is that getLine is an IO of string. It is a monad and we are forced to use the bind operator in order to get to the internal value of the monad. In order to deal with that, we need to use a new type called the Kleisley arrow, named after the concept of Kleisley categories. It's not so important what they are, it's more important what we can do with them since there does exist an instance for arrows on this Kleisley type with monads. Observe that the definition of first and second uses the bind operator of the monad in order to get to its internal value. Okay, so let's look at how these Kleisley arrows look in action. A function returning a monad is put into the Kleisley constructor which lifts the structure into this arrow context, thus making our usage of the arrow operator possible. The arrow resulting from the combination, called Ka in this example, has to be executed with the run Kleisley function, supplying the initial argument. In our example, this argument of course is irrelevant, so it's just the empty tuple. Now we can use other functions in this data flow. So the combinators we have already seen can easily be used in combination with the Kleisley constructor in order to achieve the same data flow that we have seen before with any monad we like. Nice. A topic we have not yet visited are conditionals. Sure, we can use if and case in a function we use within our data flow, but is there a possibility of incorporating the conditional computation into the data flow itself? The answer is given by choice arrows that are extending the combinators we have seen for normal arrows. Immediately we see the usage of the either type, which, if you remember from my video on it, can be used to denote a correct and a failure state. In the same vein, conditionals are treated in the choice arrow. So in the following figures, I will use the blue arrows to denote the left constructor and the red arrows to denote the right constructor. Here we see our first arrow, the left arrow, which ignores the right constructor and only changes the value of the left constructor just so that this doesn't cause any misunderstanding. The blue and red arrow are the same data value. We are just depicting it as two separate arrows because it is treated differently depending on the constructor. Similar to the left arrow, there is a right arrow, leaving the left constructor unchanged but acting on the right constructor. And also similar to the triple star, the triple plus works on both values but has different functions for left and right. This time, however, we do have a special combinator in order to translate an either value into a normal value. Depending on the constructor, we can use a different finalization function before the constructor is omitted. So let's take a look at an example. With these additions to our arrows, we can implement the map function. List case transforms the condition into a function returning an either. In our mapping, we first apply this function and then use the combinator in order to either return an empty list in the case that the list is empty and otherwise apply the function f to the head and do the recursive call on the tail. 
After that, we transform the tuples, which are now nested recursively, into a list by using the list constructor. Something we have not seen so far are arrows of higher order, meaning arrows that take arrows as arguments. Arrow applications are an extension to our arrows that have this feature. For functions, the implementation is straightforward and trivial. For monads, this definition gives rise to a very similar definition to how the bind operator is defined. And indeed, the arrow application is equivalent to monads. Summarizing the combinators we have seen shows us that in the context of functions, we could have used many alternative functions we already know, but arrows are not confined to the applications on normal functions as we have seen with the Kleisley arrows. So these kinds of combinators and compositions are also possible for monads and whatever else we can define arrows for. A wilder application of arrows is given by looping arrows. I don't want to go too in depth with these since their application is somewhat limited and also a bit confusing. Suffice it to say that looping arrows can be used to provide a feedback loop within our data flow, theoretically enabling recursion within our somewhat linear computation. Okay. I want to close this video with uh, some final thoughts on arrows, especially when comparing them to monads. Essentially, arrows are about composition and data flow. This gives rise to a point-free programming style, sometimes also called tacit programming. The usage of monads often coincides with do notation, which is an imperative style of programming. Arrows enable similar functionality in a point-free style without the need of this do notation. In general, I want to make the point that monads, while helpful, are not the end-all be-all. In fact, there are examples like parsing where arrows are easier to use and more space efficient. The compositional capabilities of arrows also make them a prime candidate for handling data streams. An example of this is given in Programming with Arrows by John Hughes. A link is in the description. We as Haskell programmers are generally too focused on monads as our tool for structuring code that we completely forget applicatives and even more out there concepts such as arrows. Instead of using the right tool for the job, we simply use a sledgehammer to destroy our project right in the beginning. So let's stop doing that. Okay, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. You wouldn't believe how many coffees I run through making one of these videos. If you'd like to support them, you can do so on Ko-fi, where you can, well, buy me a coffee. Any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you.